starting a series called Check Character. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I really believe God's been stirring our hearts for a long time about this series. And I really believe it's timely. Um, there may be some ouches for all of us. You know, this is something we're, we walk through too. But I really believe it's a, a timely message for us. And um, so today we're just going to kind of do a bird's eye view a little bit of, of the sermon. But I wanted to, to read this quote to you. It said, Your ideal is what you wish you were. Your reputation is what people say you are. But your character is what you really are. Okay? So as we talk about character, we're talking about the real you. The real you. Not who we see on Sunday. Not who you pretend to be. Not who other people say you are. We're talking about who you really are. In those quiet places where no one else sees, when it's you and God, who does God see? Who do you become? 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. The eternal one does not pay attention to what humans value. Humans only care about the external appearance, but the eternal considers the inner character. Okay, so inner character. God cares about our inner character. <laughs> you know, um, it's interesting because there's, there's a, a difference between mistakes and sins. Mistakes, we all make mistakes, right? Right? Okay, half of you are honest today. You all just made a mistake. You didn't admit. <laughs> Actually, I think that was more of a sin. A sin... <laughs> A sin is an intentional doing something that you know is against what God wants, okay? And, and, you know, it's like when you just know you're not supposed to say something and you say it anyways. You just know you're not supposed to swear at your children and you do it anyways, okay? Those are, that's a sin. It's an intentional. Mistakes... We're going to make a lot of them, right? <laughs> Until we're in heaven, we're going to keep making mistakes. But here the thing is, um, true godly... Uh, let me tell the difference between a mistake and a sin, I should say. A mistake isn't something you, in your heart, you're not wanting to do something wrong, but you do it. Okay? It happens. You may not realize what you're doing. It, it's just a mistake. Sin is when your heart knows it's the wrong thing and you still do it. Do you see the difference? It's a heart thing. And every one of us are in a different place in that journey because we have a different revelation of who God is or we've been serving God longer than, you know, if you just came to meet Jesus last night, you know, you're still trying to grasp all of this stuff that God's got and you haven't learned yet. But sin is knowing that you're intentionally doing, going against what God says. So true godly character seeks to have God help us correct mistakes, right? Because we still got to clean up the messes when we make them and to avoid sin and intentionally going against what God desires for us. Okay, so let me say that again. True godly character seeks to have God help us correct mistakes and to avoid sin and intentionally going against what God desires of us. Okay, so the, it's the inner, it's your heart. It's not about what we are just doing, but it's about our heart. You know, there's some people who are just, it's like their life looks like a mess, but their heart is so tuned into God, they just want to do everything they can, and they're still fumbling around trying to figure out what this walk with God because they haven't known Him very long. Okay, but their heart is locked on to God. You see, and others of us are playing the church thing, and doing all the woohoo, I got it all together, but our hearts are just dirty and they're a mess. And they just are like, God, I'm just going to do my own thing. You see, there's a difference. It's, we can't judge from the outside. That's why we let God judge our hearts. But we have to make sure that we are working on the heart and the character issue inside. Now, I want to read a story to you. Without Ralph here, I don't have as many breaks to have my water. In ancient China, the people desired security from the barbaric hordes to the north, so they built the Great Wall of China. It was too high to climb over, too thick to break down, and too long to go around. Security achieved. 
The only problem was that during the first hundred years of the wall's existence, China was invaded three times. Was the wall a failure? Not really, for not once did the barbaric hordes climb over the wall, break it down, or go around it. So how then did they get into China? The answer lies in human nature. They simply bribed a gatekeeper and then marched right in through a gate. The fatal flaw in the Chinese defense was placing too much reliance on a wall and not putting enough effort into building character into the gatekeeper. Wow, right? You know, we, don't, we may not think character matters, but character matters. <laughs> you know, you can do all the supposed right things. You can go to church. You can work with tons of charities. You can put the smile on your face. You know, you can give money to the, the homeless person on the corner of the street. But if you haven't got character, the enemy can come in and devour your life. Because this story is just so much like our own spiritual lives. The enemy is seeking to devour us. And we kind of go, oh, well, he can't get in. You know, I'm, I'm reading my Bible, and I'm doing this, and I'm going to church, and I'm serving, and, you know, I've done all the commit classes, I've gone through the whole movement, and I've done all these things. But we haven't worked on our character. What we're doing is we're, we're, the, we're the gatekeeper allowing the enemy to come in. And I don't want that for us. God has great plans for us. But if we're not careful with our character of who we really are, of how we act when nobody is looking, right? In those moments when we're at a computer screen and nobody's around, what are we looking at? You know, in those moments when um, you're alone with your children, how are you really treating them? You know, what's the ride from the home to the church like on a Sunday morning, right? That can be crazy. <laughs> so what is the true character of who you really are? You know, we want to build our character so the enemy cannot get a foot in the, in the door of our lives. Amen? I want to shut the door on the enemy, which means I want to build my character. I want to work on my character. I want to be... Who I am before you now is who I want to be and who I strive to be at home with my children, um, out for coffee, when I'm alone by myself. I want those two to match. Amen? So developing our character is done by tapping into the power of God that lives in us. Because many people, many times people are like, well, it's just who I am. Or how do I do that? You know? And um, it's, it's by tapping into his Power. Romans 8, verse 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. And I'm sorry, we don't have this in the app. I threw things in last night. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Amen. Amen. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You see, the sinful nature is what every one of us were born into because we live in a fallen world where... Um, Satan is alive, and he's working. And so we were born into the sinful nature, which is why we needed Jesus to come and give us a new nature. So the Bible says that when we accept Jesus Christ, the old man or the old sin nature is dead, and we come alive in a new nature, which is of Christ. That is really, really good news. Because many times we think that uh, there's, there's sort of a fallacy that we have to struggle with that sin nature and I mean I just got to keep putting that sin nature down that you know that we're sinners saved by grace well we were sinners we are saved by grace and now we may sin but we are not sinners because that is not our character or our nature we have the nature of Christ in us right now are you seeing what I'm saying we may sin but it's not who we are and it's not our character and it's not our nature anymore if we are in Christ so we don't have to struggle with that sin nature anymore, but what we do have to do is deal with our own free will because God gave us free will. We have a new, a new nature in Christ, but we have to decide, are we going to cooperate with the new nature or are we going to take the temptation Satan throws at us and, and pretend like our old nature is still ruling us? So we have decisions to make. 
You know, that little white lie that, man, it'll be easier if I just cheat on my taxes a little bit. Man, it'll be just easier if I do this. Or, man, God doesn't really care if I do that. But it matters. But I love it. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. We do not have to allow sin to control us because we have a new nature. Say new nature. Okay. We do have free will. God's given us a spirit that gives us the ability, the ability to walk free from sin. He has given us all the power of God within us to be able to have true godly character. That is amazing. So every one of us, if we have Jesus Christ inside of us, can have godly character. Amen? It's not about just obeying a whole bunch of rules. It's not just about, oh man, here we go again. I got to do this and this and this and this to be a Christian. No. It's about allowing the spirit of God that's alive in us to so well up on us that it just repels all that. That it's like, that's not even who I am anymore. You know, one of the greatest miracles that I love seeing is when people come to know Jesus and then, you know, a year later, we meet them. We just meet them when they start coming to the church. We didn't know who they were before. And they'll come up and say, man, if you only knew who I was back then, right? Like, I am so different. My friends can't even recognize me anymore because God has just so redone my life. Why? It wasn't that they had to sit down and going, okay, I got to get rid of this and this and this and this. No, but what it is is God came alive in them so much with this new nature that there was no desire or no, no um, they're not oh, what do you call it? connecting to their old life anymore because they have a new nature, and now they're not sinning because it's not in their nature anymore and they have no desire to. Are you getting this? You see, it's not about us striving to be good enough. It's about cooperating with the spirit that's already in us to live the life full of godly character, free of sin. Amen? I need to know you're tracking with me today. You see, if you have not fully accepted Jesus Christ, you will not be experiencing the power of that new nature. Okay? There's a lot of people who put one foot in to Christianity. Right? Well, I go to church. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in your garage makes you a car. Right? You got to be fully in. And when you finally say, okay, God, you know, I'm not going to do this my way anymore. I'm going to just come. I take my life. I want to be yours. When you get to that point, now you have a new nature. Now you're his. Now, like that song says, I belong to you. I belong to him. So we got to make sure if you're really struggling with character and sin, ask yourself, have I really given it all to him? Have I really gone all in? And at the end of service, we'll give you a chance to pray a prayer to have him completely come in. But God has set us apart. You know, we, we don't like to use a lot of big words because I don't know about you, but I don't always understand the big words, okay? And um, there's a lot of religious terminology out there, etc. One of them is, called, is sanctified. I grew up hearing about we got to be sanctified, redeemed, you know, all this kind of thing. And I'm like... What does that mean? You know, stand on the word of God. I'm like, why? So I can be a couple inches taller? Like, I don't understand. Uh, But sanctified means to be set apart for a purpose. Set apart for a purpose. As children of God, we have been set apart for a divine purpose. We're not supposed to live the same life we lived before we met Jesus. We're supposed to be going from glory to glory and becoming more like him. See, that's the whole purpose because we've been set apart for a divine purpose. You know, Romans 12, verse 2. It says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Wow. Do you want God to be pleased with you? I do. That means we're not supposed to look like the culture around us. That means the culture around us is not supposed to dictate what the word of God says. Right? 
forgive me if I'm stepping on toes, but I love you too much to not bring truth of the word of God. Culture cannot dictate our doctrine. Our doctrine is supposed to dictate culture. Amen. Amen. And it's about time we as Christians started rising up in the truth and impacting our culture instead of just being so politically correct that we're kind of going, whew, you know, I might offend somebody. Well, Jesus was massively offended, but he still did what he had to do for you and I, right? Man, I would rather be offending people and be politically incorrect here on earth so that I can stand before the Father someday and he can say, well done. I would hate to stand before God someday and him say, look, I was offended at you because you didn't do what I asked you to do. Man, you lived according to the world instead of according to me. You mean their opinion meant more to you than my opinion meant? Ow. You know, this time on earth is very minimal. Very minimal. We're spending eternity in heaven with God. This is just a little blip. Who cares if they don't like what you have to say? If it's in the word of God and it's truth, that is what sets people free. The truth of God sets people free. We've become a culture that is dictating what the church can and can't say and what the church can and can't preach and all of these things. It's just a mess here and in Canada. Man, Canada is going down some roads right now that is way worse than the United States as far as culture. It's scary. We need a move of God. We need a radical, radical move of God. You know, as I said, we, we will stand before God someday and give account for, for how we've lived for him. Because our purpose here is not so we can have a good time and that I get my needs met and that I felt good. Our purpose here is we are set apart for a purpose. And that's to glorify God, to serve him, to, to do what he wants us to do in this so that we can spend an eternity with him. You know, last summer we had a wedding in our house. Love it. Um, have two sons that are married right now. But in that preparation for a wedding, um, I was so honored. I have two awesome daughter-in-laws who asked me to be part of the planning process. And you never know how that's going to go when you have sons. But I was very grateful. But one of the things is you do all this planning and all this work and all these things. But the f planning for the day is not nearly as important as planning for the marriage. Right? And I so appreciated that when my kids were getting ready for their marriage, they got counseling. They worked on the inner things. They worked on the relational things. They worked on the how can we be better together forever. Amen? And you know, the Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. And that he's going to come back for us and that he wants a church that is without spot or wrinkle. And, you know, when is there, there's, there's a rapture that's going to happen, and this is all kind of revelation stuff. But there's a day where God is going to come and take all of the Christians just up. And it's called the rapture. We're not going to die. We're just going to go in a blink of an eye. You kind of go, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, it kind of is, but everything about God is a little bit crazy, right? And, um, and, and we're going to go, and that's the rapture. And then we're going to have this amazing union with God and live eternally with him. But... There is a preparation of us as the bride where we should be thinking more about who we are becoming in preparation for him than just about, woo, we get to spend, you know, eternity in heaven, yay. What about what kind of bride am I? What kind of bride am I? And, and working on our character and um, making sure that we're prepared for this. You still tracking with me? Okay. I don't want Pastor Ralph to come back next week and you kind of go, man, ditch her, get her out of here. So <laughs> there is a false doctrine going around right now and it breaks my heart. That grace covers it all. You don't have to worry about what you do. God loves you anyways. Yes, God loves you. God loves the guy who is an atheist but it doesn't mean he's pleased with him or that that atheist is in right standing with him. He loves you. 
but he has so much more for you, and he wants our character to develop. I recently, there was um, someone who used to be a, a good friend in ministry, and I recently saw their Facebook post, and it just broke my heart, because he was absolutely bashing pastors and swore, called pastors a bad name, and, and said, how dare they say that you have to be obedient and do what God says to be in right standing with him. How dare you? We can screw up and make mistakes and be a total mess and be okay. And he's justifying sin. And it's like my heart broke because he's missing the big picture. The big picture is if you are fully in Christ, why do you want to keep sinning? When you understand what he's done for you, why wouldn't you want to embrace all that he has for you? You see, Grace, he got, does God love you still? Yeah. If you turn your back on him, he still loves you. But he has so much more for you. I love it. God loves you exactly as you are, but he doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to move you into great things. So I want to just, I want to prove to you that God cares about character. Because this grace message has, as I said, it's really kind of messed some people up big time. And that, that they think we can do whatever we want and we're forgiven. We don't ever have to ask for forgiveness because God's got it. He already took care of my sin. I don't have to ask forgiveness. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. And it's scary because you're going down a dangerous path. And God cares about your character. He cares about who you are. And I want to show you in um, Revelations. We don't often preach from Revelations. It's a complex prophetic book about the end times. It talks about um, the rapture that I was talking about. It talks about when, um, you know, eternity and a lot of things. But this is in the new covenant, okay? So this is after Jesus. This is a prophetic word um, that was given. And it's God himself talking about the churches and talking about the end time church, which is us, we can apply. And he's talking to seven churches. So I want you to see this is God himself doing a character check on seven churches. Now, if the grace message, the way they say it is, is you can do whatever you want and you're good with God, then he would be happy and pleased with every one of these and sin wouldn't matter and character wouldn't matter and he would give a thumbs up to everybody. Is that correct if the grace message was that distorted grace message? Because man, the grace of God is so awesome. And it forgives us, but it empowers us not to sin. So I want to look at just the seven churches. This is in Revelation 2 and 3. I'm going to just summarize. I encourage you, go read it for yourself. So I said, don't ever take my word for it. Always read your Bible and see what the Bible has to say. But this is a prophetic message. The interesting thing is, out of the seven churches, five were reprimanded. <laughs> and only two had no complaints from God about them. Pretty crazy. So let's go through these and learn the warning signs because I don't know about you, but I want to know what is God's heart? What is his standard for character? What is his standard for um, what he wants to see in us? Okay, so this is an overview of some of these things, but he's speaking to the church, not the world. Okay, sometimes we can take when God's speaking, go, oh, well, he's talking about people before they got saved. No, he's talking to the church. So the first one was the church of Ephesus. And I'm just going to give you highlights. But they had been hard workers, and he praised them for being hard workers. But they have lost the depth of love for God and others that they used to have. So at one point, they just loved people. They loved God. They loved people. And then it just, they kind of lost that and became workers, right? Doing the right things, but not really doing it in love. I don't know about you, but I know, you know, there are some churches like that right? Where it's like all about doing all the programs, but we don't really love people. We don't really love God. And he reprimanded them. And so what is our checkup on that is, have you lost your passion? Are you operating out of just ritual or do you really still love God? You know, are you going through the motions? Have you allowed familiarity to take over? Man, familiarity, we talked about that a little while ago in a, in a message just about how toxic familiarity can be. Okay, so there's the church of Smyrna. And I'm hoping I'm pronouncing these things right, but you guys take a crack at it anyways. Um, Smyrna, it says, they, have, they had great suffering and poverty, but they will remain faithful and will receive the crown of life. He had nothing negative to say about this church. 
nothing. And uh, which is really cool because here he's saying they had, even in hardship, they stayed faithful, even in hard times. So this was not a church that looked like, yeah, let's sign up to be a Christian because it's awesome. This is where it's like, man, this is hard. It's like we're being battled at, we're being hit, we're being attacked. All these things are going wrong, but they still stayed faithful to God. You know, are we able to stay faithful to God when our circumstances don't line up what we're believing for? Right, when, man, I thought, God, that this, it was gonna happen this way, but we're taking hit and hit and hit. Will you still stay faithful and believe the word of God over what your circumstance says? Right, very, very important. And that's what this church did. They believed the word of God more than they believed their circumstance. And God said, "Woo!" And he applauded them. The next church was Pergamum. I think Pergamum. It says, they allowed the wrong teaching that allowed and encouraged sin. They did not repent. Now God said to them, he says, you have done some good things. Some good things. So once again, he's saying, look, I'm liking some of the things you're doing, but you're allowing sin to be covered and excused away. It's like what we were talking about, this false grace message that says, look, you can do whatever you want. Hear what he's saying, you know, is that's not okay. So the question for us is, are we justifying sin in our lives? Are we saying, you know what, it's okay. God loves me anyways. Yeah, he does love you anyways, but he wants you to have more. He wants you to step into a greater power. Okay, are we twisting the grace message or scripture to allow ourselves to not deal with sin? You know, that doctrine might feel good at the moment, but when we face an eternity with God, it's gonna be a different story. And so we wanna make sure we're online. The next church was Thyatira. Thyatira? I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. He praised their love and faith. Okay, so he said, man, you've got love, you've got faith. So this is like a faith church, right? Man, they're believing things down. They're loving people. It's awesome, okay? But, <laughs> you gotta know those buts, right? There was two groups he addresses in this one. The first one, he says, one group, you have allowed the Jezebel spirit. Woo-wee. Now, Jezebel, that's a whole teaching in itself. At some point, we'll get into that. But it's, it's sexual sin. It's idolatry. Idolatry means putting other things before God. It's manipulation. It's about a power grab. It's about having to have power and control. And God actually called those the depths of Satan. The depths of Satan. So here in a church, he's saying, man, your love, your faith is awesome, but you have the depths of Satan operating. (laughs) You know, and it's a dangerous thing. Ouch is right. But the second group, he says, one group in that church, he is pleased because they did not embrace those sins. So man, how we want to stay away from those things. So are you willing to, what does that mean to us? Are you willing to let God convict you of sexual sin and let him show you a better way? Are you? Are you putting pleasures and other things in front of God? You know, what's more important? You know, we don't get to church every Sunday because we've got a sporting event or we don't have this or we have that or... You know, I don't have time to spend time with God in the morning because, well, you know, I just... I gotta get to work earlier, I'd rather do this, this, and this, and this, and then there's no time for God. Are we putting other things in front of him? Sardis, the church of Sardis, it says has nothing good to say about this church, nothing. Man, oof, that hurts. There was two things he dealt, he dealt with here, and it says he had, they have a reputation for being alive. Okay, so this is the church that has the reputation for being you know, happening. They got the right music. They got everything going on. Woo, people are excited, everything else. It says, but, you say but, <laughs> but they're spiritually dead. Whew. The number two, it said that some had held fast to God and they will be rewarded. So there's this church that appears to be alive that appears to be, but they're spiritually dead. In other words, it's become all about community club. It's been all about just friendship and, and woo, rocking it and making it all look good and, and everything else. And they've missed out the spiritual side of God. And 
And one thing I found interesting was this church that he had nothing good to say about. It wasn't about sexual sin. It wasn't about, um, you know, any of that, which we would expect. We're like, oh, that's the big one. Here he's saying, I have nothing good to say because you just have, n- you're spiritually dead. Are we, have, have we allowed um, things to come in and, and to crowd that out in our lives with God? Okay, because here they're spiritually dead. I don't want a spiritually dead church. Good news. Say good news. Good news. The Church of Philadelphia. Woo! Okay, um, this one, God is pleased. He is totally pleased. He had nothing wrong to say to them. And it says, they obeyed God and did not deny him, even in persecution and trial. They had little power but persevered. Man, you got to like it. These two churches that he had nothing bad to say about were going through persecution and trial. It's like, oh. So if you're under attack, say, woo, I'm in the right place. Okay? (laughs) The point that here they said, though, is that they didn't deny him. They kept pushing through. They didn't let a doctrine of make me feel good right now rule them. They stayed true to who God was. Right? They weren't powerful in worldly terms. They may, I don't know how big they were, anything like that. But they didn't give up when they felt like giving up. They kept pushing through when they felt like giving up. And once again, we, are, we have to ask, are we willing to just refuse to deny Christ? To refuse to deny our faith when it doesn't look right? When our circumstances don't look like they're meshing? When we get persecuted for what we believe? When, when the enemy just seems to keep throwing things at us, will we keep pushing through? Then we go to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea. It said, once again, God had nothing good to say about them. Nothing. They were lukewarm. Lukewarm. I mean, it's, we're going to church. We love God. Woo-hoo. You know? But God, they didn't need God because it says they counted on their own wealth. So in other words, God wasn't their source. Okay, they became their own source. I don't really need God because I have enough money to do things myself. Right? When, like when you need God, when you have no money, you need God. How many times you pray? Like when you're in the bottom financially, that's when you start praying. Well, here they're saying they didn't need to. They could count on themselves. But the interesting thing that God said is he said he wanted to vomit them out of his mouth. Whoa. He's not saying you were so sexually corrupt that I had to vomit you out. Man, you're so full of thieves that I had to vomit you out. No, what he's saying is you're lukewarm and I want to vomit you out. Wow. Oh, this is harsh, isn't it? But the heart condition was not there to be passionate after God anymore. I want our hearts to be passionate after God. I don't want God to look at me and go, I want to vomit you out. Yeah, that's not good news. That is not good news. Okay. Are we comfortable being lukewarm for God? Or do you, have your, do you look at God as the source of your abilities? You know, the, the church is called the source because we believe that God is the source for everything. You know, uh, our boss is not our source. Our boss is just the venue or the, the tool God uses to bring us provision. But God is our source, right? Our families are not our source of contentment and fulfillment. It's just what God uses to bring love and fulfillment to us. You see, God has to be our source for everything. Okay, are you ready for some good news now? Okay, me too. God tells us all of this about the seven churches, not to make us depressed, not to go, oh my goodness, we can never measure up, but instead to warn us and to show us, um, to help us define the standard of what he believes and what he is wanting from us. Now, I don't know about you, but with your kids, with me, I have four boys, and I have learned that for me, I I live on a big property, and we have a very, very, very long driveway. And so when I, I may be wanting my kids to empty the garbages and take it to the road. So I may say, hey, can you take out the garbage? But how many of you know they hear it very differently? (laughs) Right? So I've come to, you know, it's like, okay, I take it out of the kitchen bin and I put it outside the kitchen door. Or you take it and put it in a bin, but the bin doesn't get to the 
to the driveway. Or the bin gets to the driveway, but none of the garbage inside of the house has gotten put in the bin, okay? There's a lot of different ways that can be interpreted, right? So what God is saying is, I don't want to leave anything open for interpretation. I'm showing you what grieves my heart so that you can do it the way it needs to be done. So that we can do the character check now so you're ready to be my bride. That's why he's telling us this. Not to throw shame and condemnation, but instead to bring correction. If we look at Revelation 3, verse 19 and 20. So we've just gone through chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation. And this is how he ends this. It says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. I love this. You know, this is, so if you be diligent and turn from your indifference, but it says, if you hear my voice. In other words, that's that conviction. That kind of like, man, I'm hearing this and I'm seeing, man, God, you gotta, there's some things I maybe gotta work on. God, man, there's, there's some things, you know, maybe it, I got to put that down. I got to, I got to stop being lukewarm. I got to spend time with you. That's hearing his voice. And what does it say? It said, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. Friends is intimacy. It's intimacy. That's that place with God where it's just like, man, you are not that far away. God, you are my close friend. And that comes when we allow his correction and his discipline to come in and to start allowing us to hear it and start acting on it and start changing those inner character things. You see, this is not going, man, I can never measure up. That's not what this was meant to be. This is meant to saying, look, I love you so much. I don't want to leave you where you are. I want to be close to you. I want to have an intimate relationship with you. I want to answer the needs in your heart. I want to help you with the battles and the things that are coming at you. That's what God's saying to us here. He cares more about your character than your comfort. You know, we've sold God as a God who you're going to get saved and it's all going to be great. And everything's going to be awesome. Well, let me tell you, I know he has promises. I know he has victory for you. I know that he's a healer and that he's a provider. And all of those things, and we believe that and we see it manifest. But even if those things do not manifest in this lifetime, he cares more about your character than your comfort. You know, someone who is homeless, living on a, going through a hard time, just going through a hard time, to get a million dollars, they may feel like that's the answer for their life, but without the character, some could handle it, some may not. Any one of us, you hand $10 million to us, some of you it will destroy because your character and your ability has not matched the provision. You see, God, sometimes sometimes we're stuck in places because our character is not ready for the provision. You see, we need to build our character so we're ready to handle the assignment God has for us and that it doesn't destroy us because he cares more about you and who you are and your character than you just getting every prayer answered and having every comfort that you want. I don't know about you, but with my kids, they didn't always like being disciplined. You guys, any of you guys have kids that just loved being disciplined? Yeah, bring it on. Okay, they didn't like it, but did I care? No, because I knew it was for their best, that I needed to develop their character so they could be who they're called to be. And that's what God's doing with us. He says, I care more about your character than just your comfort. And so he wants to refine us into these amazing, amazing people. You know, we're gonna end with a scripture and I want us to make this our prayer for this series. I want us to make um, this a prayer for our lives. This is a prayer I pray all the time. It's straight from scripture. But Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you 
and lead me along the path of everlasting life. You know, this is a humble posture of just saying, God, you know what? Like, it, it's, it's too easy for us to be prideful and think that we got it all together. And, and God's just sitting there going, oh, honey, we got a long way to go, okay? <laughs> How much better for us to just say, God, I wanna, I wanna serve you. I wanna do the very best for you. Search my heart. If there's something in there, I want it gone. You know, I want him to do heart surgery on me, and it might hurt a little bit, but I would rather get the cancer out than have someone come and just put a Band-Aid on it and tell me I'm okay, right? It's the same thing. There are cancerous things growing in our hearts that we need to allow God just to come in and say, God, okay, you know what? I'm gonna take this seriously. Yeah, it doesn't feel good all the time. Yeah, there's some challenges that are gonna come. Man, there's some convictions. There's some days I'm gonna feel like running out of this church because I don't wanna hear it anymore. But you know what? When God goes in and starts doing that surgery in your heart, he's setting you up for a divine purpose. He's setting you up to be the bride of Christ where he says, man, I am so well pleased. I am so well pleased. You know, the first thing, part of this whole thing, as I said before, is to be able to operate in in true godly character and have his nature is to have Jesus in our lives. And that is the first step. Man, he died so that our old nature could die and we could come alive with a new nature. And that is the essence of true character, of being able to have the power of God in us. And so I, I want us all to close our eyes. I'm gonna pray a prayer. And if you just need that, if you're like, man, I haven't accepted Jesus, I haven't fully given in. Maybe you've partly given in, maybe you've said it with your, your mouth, but you haven't really given at all. I want you to pray this with me because he hears you. You know, it says, if anyone hears my voice and knocks, I will come in. He wants to come into your life and make a difference. So if, if that's something you want, I want you to repeat this. We're all gonna repeat it. All of those who already have Jesus in their life, I want you to repeat it with me. This is, dear Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me. I believe you died for me. And I receive that gift of salvation. I give you everything. Lead me. Guide me. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to pray one other thing for us. Just keep your eyes closed. I just want to pray over us that we have hearts that are open, that we, we allow the, the brick wall of protection to start breaking, that we don't stay so caught in having to defend ourselves that we don't let God in. And we, we get defensive with the way we've always done it or, or that reputation we have or anything else, but God sees our heart. He already knows what we're dealing with. He already knows. There's nothing you can hide from God, so why not surrender? So Lord, I just thank you for each and every person right now. Lord, I just pray that we would have hearts that fully surrender, that fully obey, that just yield to you absolutely everything. We thank you, God. I pray that you would do a deep work in our heart. Lord, may we not run from your correction or your discipline. May we not run from messages that are hard, but God, may instead, may we run directly into your lap because you are the answer, because you are the one who gives us the power to deal with those things, Lord. You are the one who wants intimacy with us. I just thank you, Lord, for open hearts today, for open lives that just say, come in, God, search me and know me. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.